Welcome to the Answer Real Paradigm Shifters podcast. This show is for and about the entrepreneurs who work to improve and expand our human well being by bringing cutting edge technologies and ideas to life. We are Magnus and Marie Dahlgren, your hosts. In this episode, we talk with Vijay Rabindran. Vijay is co founder and CEO of Florio, a company that leverages the power of the virtual reality to develop a supplementary method of teaching social and communication skills for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And now, here is our conversation with BJ Rabindran. How would you want to be introduced to our listeners? Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Vijay Rabindran, uh, CEO and co-founder of Florio. Nice to meet you. Hello. That's great. Good to meet you. Vijay, and could you share with us and our listeners, please, something which would surprise our listeners to know about you? Um, well, I grew up in Oklahoma, <laughs> and so uh, in a in a college town, and uh, I get a lot of. I've never met anyone from Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and uh, when I'm out on the East Coast. That's great. You're a co-founder of such a company as Florio. Could you share please a little bit more? Yeah, so Florio was started a little over two years ago. And the insight for Florio came from seeing the first impressions of my son's experience with virtual reality. Uh, He really enjoyed it. He's on the autism spectrum and we were always looking for opportunities to uh, help spur new engagement yes and my wife came up with the idea of could virtual reality be a teaching medium Mm -hmm. for social and communication skills such as what uh there's so much emphasis and focus for children with autism to develop the product that we are doing testing as well as offering to schools and therapy practices today, uh, uses smartphone-based virtual reality and pairs that device with an iPad that acts as a uh, control console for a supervising adult. Mm -hmm. We develop content to work on different types of social and communication skills including life skills such as crossing the street. Um, And from the iPad, the adult is able to do a few things that are very important uh, for our system. They can see everything that the child is seeing in the headset, Hmm. which otherwise, without that, virtual reality can be a very isolating experience. One person puts the headset on, everyone else around them has no idea what they're looking at. Yeah. Uh, and and so we enable the iPad to give you a view of what the child is seeing in virtual reality. We uh, do that in real time without any wires. So a lot of the virtual reality headsets are tethered and require cables or require uh, hooking up to a PC. Yeah. Um, because we use smartphone-based virtual reality and do this all over Wi-Fi, Uh, It's very comfortable. It can fit a lot of different situations in a home or a therapy center or a school classroom environment. Mm -hmm. From the iPad, the adult can also interact with the person in the virtual reality environment. They can manipulate some of the characters in the scenes. Uh, And they also (laughs) are given uh, suggestions on how to coach the child as they're going through the scene. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we, expen- we extensively use head-based tracking to also inform uh, animations that might uh, trigger in the scenes, uh, instructions that we might deliver to the adult, and assessment on how the child is performing a particular skill. Yeah. Thank you very much for such a detailed explanation. And um, I know that there are some differences, neurological differences in um, autistic brain. Could you explain a little bit more? What are these differences and what are the difficulties, challenges, at, at the same time, strengths of such brain? 
Yeah, so uh, people with autism uh, have uh, a number of different challenges. They have strengths around organizing information and uh, areas like memory. Yes. Uh, and following structure. Uh, that being said, uh, children with autism have a wide range of different behaviors, which is why it's called a spectrum. Yeah. So, um, but there are a uh, concentrated set of developmental areas where children with autism have delays. Um, those delays uh, are in the area of speech, mm -hmm. um, the area of social skills, yes. um, and uh, that extends to uh, areas where uh, context and cultural norm norms and uh, a lot of uh, soft skills, so to speak, that uh, most of us take for granted end up being very challenging for these children to understand, interact with, and adapt to. Yeah. Um, as as uh, one person puts it, it's, it's, all, it's about all of the unwritten rules in life and how quickly you can understand those, that those end up being harder for uh, someone with autism sometimes to adapt to and understand and conform to. Yeah. Does, uh, I want to call it a system, but maybe it's not a system. It, does, does it adapt to the child dynamically or does the parent set that or is, is there a, since it's on a spectrum, uh, Please, could you tell us how the system works for severe or not so severe cases? Yeah, great question. So uh, children can have a range of delays. So, you know, you a common question we get when, when someone looks at some of the interventional content we're developing that's delivered through the Florio system mm -hmm. is, well, what age is this content meant for? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is that it really depends on the extent of the developmental delay. Um, you know, one of our, so for instance, our, our most tested set of interventional content is around a important developmental skill called joint attention, which involves two people having a shared experience. So if I point at the uh, lamp that's between the two of you in the background and say, oh, that's a really pretty that's really pretty, and I point at it. You know what I'm pointing at. Joint yeah, attention. And, um, and if someone does not have joint attention, then they are lost in the conversation from then on. Yeah. And so you could imagine that that type of referential uh, element that merges visual and audio uh, is a very important part of how we communicate. And if that's delayed, then uh, communication uh, built on top of that is very difficult. And uh, and so the content we're developing could be applicable to a seven-year-old. It could be applicable to a 25-year-old. It really depends on the severity of, of their autism and how it's presented. And, and that really ends up dictating the delay. Um, that's why the system is also designed to, to leverage a supervising adult to select the content. Um, because to know that about a child or an adult with autism is something that uh, you know a computer system would have a lot of difficulty with today's technologies yeah. discerning. So we we've designed Florio from the ground up to work alongside a therapist, special education teacher, a parent, and leverage their judgment to um, help influence the the right content for the right person. Um, the other element that's been very important when thinking about the range of uh, ability. Of the, of the children that are experiencing Florio today is that um, the design of the, of the gameplay of the lessons themselves have been made to be very adaptive and forgiving. Yeah. So, um, you know, in, in one of our lessons, for instance, for joint attention, the child is in a safari park and different animals make uh, animal sounds and then the child is expected to locate the animal making the sound and make eye contact with them. And for someone like you or I, we might go through those three tasks in the lesson within 20 seconds. 
you know, very quickly. Yes. And for a child with, you know, severe autism, each task might take quite a bit of time to develop that, you know, to, to locate something. And, uh, and that's okay in Florio, that we've designed things so that a child could take quite a bit of time to, to locate those animals or could progress very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that part of the ability to, to accommodate people of differing abilities is part of the design of the content that we've had to uh, make a key, a key feature. That's great. That's good. And uh, when you develop this content, is there a, a set of guidelines that you follow or do you test it on somebody first? So, <laughs> Yes and yes. <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's part of, uh, you know, it's a tired expression. That's part of the secret sauce of what we're doing is, uh, is that we have uh, leveraged my and my wife's experience as parents, but also my wife is a computer science PhD and, uh, and on the faculty at the University of Maryland in College Park. And, um, you know, after our son was diagnosed, she uh, took a leave of absence from the university and uh, completely enveloped herself in uh, the types of interventional therapies that my son was receiving. And, um, and as part of that, She's read so many academic papers. She's uh, learned so many elements, and and those that background combined with her computer science background and my technology background uh, have all been put into play to develop a set of principles in creating the content and in um, implementing it to conform with the way that we think we can best deliver this type of uh, training. Beyond that, um, you know, we uh, have very much dedicated ourselves to this company developing science-backed yes. content and product. And the research is very important to us. It's why um, we very early on began engaging both special education schools and clinical professionals and ultimately have a have a really robust relationship with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Center for Autism Research. And um, our process involves starting with developing content, uh, playing that content in our office. Uh, my son plays a prominent role in testing things out the first time. He's a very enthusiastic employee uh, <laughs> in his own right. And then, and then we use different forums to further develop feedback um, our school partners and our clinical partners also help trial software for us to provide us feedback. Um, we also have developed a great relationship with several uh, organizations that hold exhibitions of uh, for families with special needs. Um, our most recent event was at the Please Touch Museum in Philadelphia. And in events like this, we're able to uh, meet dozens of families in one stretch and try out new content and get feedback from the kids directly. Um, and then we have invested in uh, true academic re style research to look at feasibility, usability, and efficacy. In, and so those have been investments that we have made both with our school partners uh, and through our healthcare partners and through our medical research relationship with, with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. That's great. You started to talk about um, other parents and other children. And I would like to ask you, what is your mission? Yeah, uh, our, our mission is to you know, build an indispensable service for uh, families like ours with uh, children with special needs. We start with autism, but we believe that the uh, approach to using virtual reality to deliver uh, uh, interventional content uh, can extend very, very widely um, beyond autism. But we're very focused on helping families with autism today um, you know, be able to uh, make a difference in their children's lives, be able to step into uh, doing more than they're able to do today. Um, and you know that starts with parents, but it also extends to giving valuable tools to 
uh, professionals such as special education teachers and therapists. Thank you. I was curious, uh, since this is a relatively new development in autism treatment, have you found anything that contradicts what uh, common wisdom is about autism or, or uh, have, have you discovered something new that was not mentioned in the papers before, seeing as your wife <laughs> read a lot of papers? She says, right. no, this paper is wrong. Uh, did, have, what, what have you found if you've found anything? Well, I, I think, I don't know if there's a specific example. I mean, I think, let me answer that question a couple of different ways. Okay. Um, the first is that virtual reality has developed quite a bit in the last three years from where it was five and seven years ago. Um, one of the realities as a result is that a lot of the research that claims to be virtual reality research predates the type of head mounted displays that we have access to today and two years ago. And so uh, while we read a lot of research, um, the intervention, the digital intervention research that existed and the ones that existed specifically in virtual reality in most cases involved kids surrounded by monitors or two large monitors sitting in front of them, which was then called virtual reality. Um, there's an academic expression called CAVE, VR, C-A-V-E. Um, and this is, these are techniques where monitors are used. In our opinion, research using uh, non, not research that didn't involve head mounted display virtual reality was almost irrelevant to us um, because head-mounted displays are, are so different. And in particular with the uh, population in autism where they might have sensory sensitivities to having a headset placed on their heads, um, reading a feasibility study that you know, 20 kids comfortably looked at three monitors surrounding them, you know, how much relevance does that have towards building a virtual reality solution using uh, you know, smartphone-based VR and a headset. Um, we, we, we didn't take too much stock in that. Um, early on, once we had a, a minimal viable, you know, prototype that we could basically show, uh, we got a lot of clinical-facing feedback from therapists and research professionals. Yes. And I would say probably the biggest concern that they would express was that they didn't think children would, with autism would wear the headset. That the headset, because so many of, of, of kids with autism have sensory sensitivities, you know, tags on shirts and um, you know, loud noises, and that they just they had a lot of concerns that the headset would would be an issue. And what we've found now, having you know, literally seen a thousand plus kids use the system. And going through, you know, our first pilot was over five weeks, three times a week intervention for, for the kids, is that uh, of which we had a 98% completion rate in, in sessions over those, you know, with, with those 12 kids, um, is that children love VR. Children with autism love VR, that they, they enjoy it. They might have some initial nervousness about trying something for the first time, but uh, we have quickly, working with our school and therapy company partners, developed several techniques that warm a child up to using virtual reality. And then once they get over that initial caution, they enjoy it greatly. And so that's always a surprise when we, when we tell clinical professionals, because every time we present to any forum, people will be like, I'm not sure if my kid will wear the headset. Mm -hmm. and, um, we have a lot of data now that shows that uh, kids actually kids really enjoy it and that headset sensitivity is not a big deal from what we can tell. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's less about what's in the papers and more about uh, clinical people's first reactions to the type of solution we're developing and, mm -hmm. and what we've seen in the field that has basically been a counterbalance to that, to that type of a concern. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask you, what is your one biggest challenge currently in your business? Yeah. Um, so so uh, we're, we've made very good progress in showing that virtual reality-based content can lead to, to skill improvement. 
Um, we feel really good about where we are, um, given our stage of company, the type of partners we have, and how we're building that out. Um, one of the big challenges uh, for, for autism specifically is that the way solutions are delivered to families is very diffuse. Mm -hmm. Those solutions, you know, span uh, special education programs and schools, the healthcare system and therapy companies that uh, are available to families once they have an autism spectrum diagnosis. Employers are offering uh, products as additional benefits beyond the basic medical uh, coverage. Uh, and parents um, often, especially if they have the means uh, financially, are looking for solutions independent of any of those three <laughs> previously. Yeah. And, and, and that's reflective of, uh, and we've been there, that uh, you can feel pretty desperate uh, when you're going through these struggles with, the ch with your child and you feel the clock ticking, you feel that you're falling further and further behind uh, your peer set fam families that have children at the same age but are able to do more. Yeah. And, and you see your child uh, unhappy or suffering and there's incredible fear and desperation um, that can come, come out. And uh, you know, the, the ugly side of that is that can lead to families chasing unproven solutions that can be painful or dangerous yeah. uh, for themselves. Uh, but uh, what it also means is that it's a crowded market. Uh, of, there's lots of people uh, merchandising solutions to help these families. And even once you uh, filter those that have science backing what, you're, what they're doing, um, there's several different channels that families are able to procure these types of services. And so on the business side of what we're doing, figuring out the best way to deploy a solution like this and distribute it and market it. And ultimately, I think also, uh, you know, ensuring that this can be a product that can be flexible enough that it's you need to be powerful enough for a therapist or a special education teacher to leverage, but simple enough that a parent can use. If we can mm -hmm. achieve that, then we can we can have our cake and eat it too. But um, if we can't achieve that, then we'll have to focus on, on one of those channels. Thank you very much. And I have a question. What would you want to tell to parents who are listening to us right now and who are in the midst of their despair because, as you said, their children are suffering and they actually don't know for sure what to do. And at the same time, they have to do it with something. What would be your words which can give them hope? Yeah. Well, the good news is that uh, there are a lot of people that we've been able to meet over these last two years who care very much about families like ours and helping develop new solutions to help um, you know, my advice for families, if they don't have a diagnosis yet, but they're concerned about the behavior of their child, is to, you know, please get screened as quickly as possible. Um, the diagnosis gives you power. The diagnosis gives you access to services. It opens up insurance. It gets school systems to help with services that they have access to. Um, and, and then, you know, parents are ultimately the best judges of, what solutions make the most sense for the child. So, they, so, you know, parents have to take an active role and that's something we embrace and it's a core value of the company that, uh, that we start from a position of believing that parents are smart and capable and they care deeply about their child and the products we're building go with that. It's not a substitute for the parents uh, and their judgment. Um, and that, uh, and that to, uh, you know, really, uh, while we want everyone to be open-minded and be willing to try things, to also be discerning because um, not everything has, has research, not everything has gone through testing. Um, and I know from my, you know, the, the number of junk products marketed to us uh, once uh, people could figure out that we were a family with, with autism um, was, you know, it's, it can be it can be very difficult to say no to products that are promising the world, but then when you look into it closer, and this is where my wife and I, being both engineers, we, um, 
you know, could quickly kind of tell, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I feel for parents that, uh, that have to wade through this because unfortunately, uh, unlike other medical diagnoses is where you just go to your one doctor and your one doctor tells you exactly what to do and yeah. then you go do the treatments based on what the doctor says and you'll be fine. Um, autism is different. Uh, autism is uh, something that uh, requires an incredible amount of nuance and care. Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately, as we found, is to, is to find the strengths and the, the joys that come with it. Um, and, uh, and that also lets you realize that there, there's so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you just mentioned some of the joys and strengths that come along with uh, an autism diagnosis. Could you share with us what some of those joys and strengths are, please? Yeah, well, I mean, I think our, the first is that uh, you meet incredible families once you join this community. I mean, the, the families you meet are the ones who uh, go above and beyond sacrificing for their kids and 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 so it's it's incredible um, and it's you know you once you once you isolate these families together you just end up being inspired by uh, the incredible love that uh, parents can have um, you know I, this varies uh, child to child and some kids are more severely impacted and have different and different comorbid disabilities but. In our case, our son has some fantastic strengths. Um, yeah. you know, he loves maps and navigation. He gets and he's very excited about certain things, uh, freight trains and traffic lights and and basically when you can find those areas that he's really interested in, it is so much fun. Mm -hmm. He uh, and and so you know I think that's. Those are some of the joys is that he, you know, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. And um, if he finds something that he finds interesting and wants to get into, then um, you can, you know, the reward you feel in helping deliver that happiness is, uh, is really special. And Vijay, could you please tell to people and the parents who would want to be connected with the community, as you said, who feel maybe isolated right now, in, again, in their despair, where to go, how to contact you or this community? Please give some context. Yeah. Well, um, as, as you mentioned, you know, our product is very much still in development. Um, and you know our our product, uh, the best way to keep track of uh, its progress and eventual availability later this year is by going to floriotech.com, f l o r e o t e c h dot com, and we have uh, registration forms there for parents, special education professionals, and therapists and therapy companies. Um, and then based on uh, which of those cases you are, we can. Uh, help uh, in some cases uh, provide early access to the product, um, in other cases add you to a list so that when the product is ready for you that we'll be, you'll be notified. Um, you know, I found uh, help from a lot of different places, uh, you know, our fam you know, between uh, in the DC area, DC Urban Moms is a very prominent website that has a whole area for special needs families that are able to, to get assistance in navigating therapists, school programs, um, and the like. And so that, so finding local message boards and resources so that uh, you can commune with other special needs families in your area is very important because um, understanding where to find professional services can be very difficult. Um, there's no easy Google search to find, find the right professionals that you want. Um, they advertise themselves in a lot of different ways. And like with most things, you you know, the first person you find is usually not the best one. So um, you have to uh, you have to use referrals and uh, and and other ways to, to find find the right resources. Um, you know, if you work for a large company and the employer side, there's there are services usually there, and a lot of families don't discover those because they don't call the helpline, they don't um, do that next level of a search. Um, so, but it's, you know, families have to understand once they have a diagnosis that 
uh, they are now the general contractor building their child. Um, if they didn't know that already as just parents, you know, par parenting in general is very challenging, but once you have a special needs child, you have to, you know, you're gonna have to work overtime. And, uh, and so uh, I think the sooner one embraces that, um, the better, the sooner you embrace the diagnosis, um, also the better um, that, well, that allows you to start developing plans of action. I have a question about the name of your company. Why Florio? Why did you call also, it that? Yeah, Florio means blossom in Latin. It's the Latin root of flourish. Huh. Um, and so it reflects also our mission, which is that we're trying to build a technology product that allows every child to flourish. That's great. That's great. Thank you. And uh, what are your plans for the next five years for Floria? <laughs> and maybe you would want to share personal uh, plans too? Yeah, well, you know, my wife and I are very invested in our kids. And so, uh, you know, they're eight and four years old and they're a handful and, uh, and, and a lot of fun. So, you know, it's very hard to think about next five years beyond thinking about the type of uh, support and love we want to provide to our kids. I think on the on the work side uh, and, and Florio, the company, uh, we want to build a product that reaches millions of families in the world. Um, you know, we especially believe that a virtual reality based solution like this could really help uh, families that live in rural, rural parts of America, yeah. uh, third world countries where there's not a density of professional services um, and, uh, and open up uh, services to a whole world of people that don't have access today um, for a variety of cost and availability uh, reasons. That's great. Uh, we believe that the system we're developing that allows for real-time coaching through the iPad while uh, a person is receiving intervention content in a virtual reality headset um, applies more broadly than autism. So, and we already see that happening with some of our school trial partners where they're uh, also using Florio with emotionally disturbed ch children, uh, ADHD, anxiety. And so, uh, you know, we think that there's a big opportunity to, to develop a wide catalog of content that can uh, help, uh, you know, across a, a big set of uh, initially childhood developmental delays, but eventually wider than that. Um, you know, many families will view our police encounter uh, lessons that we've been developing where mm -hmm. a child has to learn uh, how to interact with the police officer that confronts them on the street. And the applicability of training like that is much wider than autism. You know, I think uh, there's many families in this country, in the U.S., who have a lot of concerns about whether their child will be safe if they encounter the yes. police and uh, you know, understand the type of language that the police will use, behave in the right way, do not present themselves as a danger to police. Yeah. I have read, to be honest, on your website that you have sensory-based tools yeah. in development. Could you explain a little bit more what kind of sensory-based tools are they? Yeah, um, so uh, taking a step back again, uh, children, children with autism uh, can uh, be disrupted by uh, sounds, noise, a uh, lot of activity, background conversation. Um, what you see happening more and more in affluent schools is the development of what are called sensory rooms. And these rooms, which can be very expensive to build um, it's not uncommon to see a school spend fifty, fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars to outfit a room. Is to create a quiet room where the the children are able to go into that room. There might be calming lights. There might be things to fidget with, um, and and that this allows a child to take a sensory break before coming back into the cacophony of uh, the regular environment. Yes. And our simple idea is. Well, what aspects of these sensory rooms can we build in virtual reality such that families and schools have a more portable, affordable, accessible solution to use? And so uh, are there ways to create scenes that can elicit calming, 
and uh, relaxation for this population um, uh, of kids with autism and, and other adjacent areas. Um, we have two scenes today that uh, we are trialing in different ways. Um, the first has been uh, is where the child is surrounded by a xylophone that is in virtual reality and that their gaze activates the keys to play music. And uh, that uh, xylophone scene has been very popular with kids because it's very simple. They get it almost immediately what's happening. Um, and But it has a very important concept, uh, which is that the child has complete control. Mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, uh, if you can give control back to the child for a brief moment, you can help them help themselves. That's uh, most of the time when they're getting flustered and uh, frustrated it's because they don't have control of their world in the way that they want to. And, not, and because they have challenges around flexibility, it's, it's, it's putting them into a state of distress. Yeah. And so uh, our xylophone scene has been really useful in our school pilots. Um, in fact, in our first pilot, we hadn't trained the teachers on using it, but when they saw a couple of kids uh, being hesitant about using virtual reality, they mm -hmm. had those kids do xylophone first and then do the joint attention, actual intervention uh, mm -hmm. content. And they kids, um, they want to play. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun. You get an idea of how virtual reality feels, um, and then you're warmed up to try other things from there. Um, and so our, our second uh, calming relaxation, sensory regulation style scene is teaching some basic breathing and mindfulness. Um, and the twist from you know, a, a, a standard mindfulness commercial app is that we're building it for kids and we're building it for kids with autism. So uh, you know, kids with autism, one of the things 99% uh, of parents will tell you if they have a child uh, is that kids with autism love trains. And so trains elicit a great amount of joy to kids with autism. I can't explain to you the science or the why behind that. It just is. And, uh, and so in our breathing mindfulness lesson, the rewards as the child breathes and, and complies and participates ends up being they're at a train station and the train ends up leaving the train station and coming back and going into a tunnel and they can, and those, uh, those things for this very specific audience are very important. <laughs> yes. yes, I have uh, I have read that a lot of times children with autism, they're saying that they feel like their minds are separated from their bodies. And through the virtual reality experience, they feel like they can actually be again in charge and in control of the environment. And so that reinforces their motivation to proceed, to continue. That's, that's very interesting. And um, also, I would like to share with you that we had uh, a guest on our podcast who for five or seven even years, he was studying the impact of virtual reality on our genes, epigenetics. And what he told us that, yes, that's for real, according to the research and statistics, that virtual reality, such exercises or games which you develop, they uh, influence our genes. Would you share with, with us what is your passion? How do you think? Is it your job or maybe it's more bigger than your Well, part? I think what, so, you know, I started my career as a software engineer. Um, I was an early Amazon engineer. I joined in 1998. Um, I was there for seven years. So I was there when the company was very small and uh, as it got progressively bigger. And, uh, and of course, since I left, I left in 2005, so it's gotten considerably bigger since then. Um, but what I've been able to do since is uh, be able to take the technology skills I was able to learn during my time at Amazon and put it to uh, causes that I think are, are worth spending my time on. So um, my first job afterwards was helping start a political data mining company that helped Democrats and progressive campaigns because I was very involved and wanted to make a difference in that space. And I was able to end up working closely with both the Clinton and Obama campaigns during 2008. Um, my job after that was going to the Washington Post company and 
uh, being able to work on a mission of building new products to help journalism. Huh. Um, and so journalism is a big passion of mine. And uh, I'm currently on the board of a, a public newspaper company called McClatchy, uh, which operates 30 newspapers in the U.S. Um, and on another board of a nonprofit called the Lentfest Institute that uh, is uh, uh, essentially funding and writing grants and supporting activities to figure out how to save local journalism. Huh. Um, <laughs> and so, and so, and then I've, uh, you know, I launched Florio really because, you know, if we didn't build this, I didn't think anyone else would. Um, you know, my wife and I have a very unique combination of skills and experience. Yes. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, really understand who we're building this for because it is us um, from, uh, from, from all our experience. And so, uh, but I think the opportunity to, to work at a mission driven company and um, is it, that's to me that, that is, uh, if you have the opportunity to, to do what you love and to know that it's helping the world and uh, in a positive way, that's, um, that's a great goal to strive for. Yes, we agree with you, absolutely. I, I'm just curious, uh, this uh, system is about treating, uh, the treatment of autism. Have you found anything that would show what the cause of autism is? Uh, is there any consensus on what <laughs> causes yeah, I mean, you're, you're, in many ways you're asking the wrong person and that uh, I'm very focused on helping the families that are in our situation. Um, and I'm not focused on why okay. the, the whys and the hows. It is what it is. And okay. uh, how do we make it? How do we make them, the kids who have autism, reach their fullest potential and live great lives? So, you know, very focused on on that. And uh, and I know there's lots of other people and money that are thinking about uh, other elements of it, but uh, but it's not my space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And could you share with us, please, the story in your life when you experienced the biggest aha moment? Do you remember such? <laughs> um, for Florio specifically, or? Um, it, it's up to you, actually. <laughs> the biggest aha moment. <laughs> the biggest aha moment. Um, gosh, I mean, I think, look, you know, bringing it back to why we're talking, which is Florio, um, you know, the aha moment for him, for, for the company really was uh, my son's first experience <laughs> with virtual reality. I had uh, bought a Samsung Gear VR and gotten a cardboard headset. And uh, I think at that point I'd also bought an Oculus DK2. Uh, and, and then Google Street View came out in VR. Uh, yeah. And and so I, try, I, I had him try it out and... Uh, he was so excited, and in particular, what was exciting was not that he said he liked it or that he did it, but it was that he engaged in conversation afterwards that was noteworthy and more engaged than what we were yeah. used to seeing. And he started actually uh, doing some pretend play and some um, uh, kind of planning what he wanted to do next. And That's great. it was, and so it was. There was a level of executive function. Yes. Also being demonstrated that we had, that my wife and I hadn't seen before, and that really spurred the aha moment of, oh, this is really powerful. Um, it's doing something really interesting. And, uh, and I have to tell you, I mean, when we do these exhibitions with special needs families at children's museums and, and other events, it's not, uh, it's at least once uh, a demonstration will have uh, parents make a reference as their child is going through one of the sessions and say, oh, my child never pays this much attention in real therapy. <laughs> um, because the virtual reality has this calming, uh, focusing element to it yes. uh, with certain kids. And, yes. uh, and for these parents who have seen their children struggle to focus and, and uh, pick up new skills, when they <laughs> see the child succeeding in the VR environment, it's so powerful. Um, you know, the, when the parents say, oh, wow, I had no idea that, you know, they, they could settle down this much and focus. 
um, it's possible. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the powerful thing about virtual reality is that we can build these environments tailored to uh, how to get the children to be comfortable, how to have them focus, have them work on their skills, um, and then be able to stair step them so in ways to eventually so that they are ready for the real world in a way that they just couldn't be if they got conventional interactions. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I have another question. I have a question about failures. All of us in our lives, we experience failures from time to time. My question is, what was your biggest failure and how did you overcome it? And what have you learned from this failure? Yeah, that's, I mean, I've worked on a lot of technology projects, so I've seen a lot of things fail. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm having, now I have to choose like which one is a good thing to, to talk about. Um, but, uh, but I think, uh, you know, when I was at Washington Post, I oversaw a labs group that worked on experimental news products. So failure was part of the DNA of figuring out where the future lies. And, um, you know, I think one, one of the products we worked on, uh, which was called Washington Post Social Reader, uh, grew quite a bit because it, it took advantage of a capability in Facebook that um, they had given access to, which they then eventually took away, which ended up eventually essentially killing the product. Um, but uh, the real takeaway from that experience, so this was, a, this was an app that spread virally, um, but it didn't, it didn't deliver a real service. It was just very good as a technique of getting into the Facebook newsfeed and getting in front of people's faces. And so <laughs> it, it essentially, um, and you see this all the time, especially with Facebook, um, but with Google too, right? So you have a lot of businesses that are just really good at gaming search, sure. And, uh, and so it ended up not succeeding. Uh, and it had this incredibly powerful lesson in, in it, which is that um, if you're going to build something that's going to last long term, there has to be true substance to it. Yes. Um, it has to truly engage. And, and so that's part of, that's one of our core values at Florio is that what we're building is real. We're not going to trick people into downloading it or staying subscribed to it when, once it's launched. We're gonna, they're going to stay subscribed because the children are going to be able to do things that they didn't think they could do. Yes. They're going to see improvement. And if, we, if they don't see that, they won't stay as customers, and that's okay. And that um, our goal is to build something that is real and substantive, and that the business will reward itself if we can actually do that. You started to talk about values, and what are the main values in life for you? Main values in life? Um, so, look, I've been very focused on family, um, uh, and, uh, and I think that's especially true once you have kids. And I think that'd be true even if we weren't a special needs family, um, but that only accentuates that. Um, uh, I worked a lot of hours when I was at Amazon. Um, it was a very uh, intense environment, um, and uh, and I think you know I think there's a real value in being able to to engage with people and uh, and to have uh, interests and passions that are you know. You know, unless you can bring them together in the way that we have at the moment, I think uh, you know, developing that type of balance and connection to the world is really important. I think that's why I like living in Washington D.C. too, is that we're we're at the center of so many things happening in the world, and uh, and you know, we're one protest. We can you know, if there's anything that we don't like, we can join a protest at the moment. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think uh, you know, having lots of interesting. Uh, hobbies and things that you want to go deeply into has been always really important to me and uh, and then being able to to work on meaningful problem problems that's fantastic thank you for sharing but you talked a lot about families and, and children using this product uh, does it have any utility for older people on the uh, spectrum well uh, yes we believe so um, in fact, our research at Children's Philly involves teenagers and adults um, because the police intervention lessons really apply to a much wider range than, than, than children, so to speak. Uh, 
And so uh, we definitely see the opportunity to use VR as a uh, as a as a as a training me to medium for for, for adults. Um, the area we're most interested in, and uh, in many ways we're looking for the right partner and the right opportunity, is around the job training space. So we were a speaker at the, at the Autism at Work conference in Seattle in April that Microsoft uh, hosted um, that brought together many of the large company employers that have created special programs to help people, adults with autism find uh, meaningful employment. Yeah. Um, employment is a huge issue in the autism community. The unemployment rates are extremely high. I think uh, if you look at employment, there was a great article on Slate that talked about this uh, about a year ago, but there's, if you look at uh, un unemployment and underemployment, it's between you know, 50 and 80% of, mm -hmm. uh, of employable adults uh, with, with autism diagnosis are, on, are in that state. And, uh, and this is despite the fact that so many of these people with autism have tremendous skills, uh, and uh, but they lack the complement of social and communication skills to to be able to um, conform to the ways jobs are you know, structured and presented. And uh, and so um, we think there's some great opportunities to use virtual reality in that space. Um, we don't have any shining examples uh, of that yet, but when you think of uh, training someone on how to use the cash register or how to perform customer service interactions, um, virtual reality can be a really great teaching tool, we believe. Yes, yes, we agree with you. Yes, it's really a very great tool. Now I have one more question. Is there something we didn't ask you about, but you would like to talk about today? <laughs> Um, I think you've asked you've asked quite quite a few thorough questions. So, um, and uh, you know, I think I would just kind of circle back to for families and professionals in the autism space that are hearing this that um, please do check out what we're doing at floriotech.com and uh, and stay on our newsletter. We share lots of interesting information that we're seeing in the research space as well as. Uh, previewing new content that we're developing. Um, and uh, this is very much uh, a project of passion. Um, and uh, even, you know, despite the fact that we have venture investment and NIH grant, and we're doing this because we feel a deep yearning to, to help families like in our situation. And um, what has also happened, which is great, is that people have come out of the woodwork to help us in different ways. Um, from our logo to uh, we've gotten help from so many great families and, and professionals that have been touched by autism themselves. Um, and so there's a real opportunity to help help us, you know, help the community. And, uh, and so we'd love to see uh, people listen to this show up and say they heard the podcast and that they want to help and have ideas, whether it's new content to help their you know kids or people they know in their life that could use uh, this type of interventional training um, to other aspects of what we're doing so it's uh, it's very much a, it's a village that is helping us get to where we are thank you very much thank you vijay for such a great interview i thank think you. we got a lot of valuable information and our listeners too we sure appreciate it thank you very much great thank you take care bye-bye